Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. It's kind of a weird delay on that speaker. My name is Dave Henderson. I am the first vice president of Vallejo Education Association. I'd like to welcome everyone here for our public forum. I'd like to thank you for showing up tonight. I wanted to make a special thank you to the Vallejo Times Herald that's also here, as well as the Vallejo Independent Bulletin. So while we may not have too many people here, we, are, we do have the media here. That being said, I do have a few introductions I do need to do. Of course, our two candidates that are running for a two-year seat term. We have Robert DePrato and Tony Obadi. Did I pronounce that right? Obadi. 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 Just ask the kids in my classroom, I forget names so easily, too. I also wanted to do a special thank you to uh, Scott Heineke, who was the high school director who helped get this set up tonight. I also wanted to thank um, Ron West and Jenny Acker for their support showing up in case, you know, helping out with the crowds, if needed. And of course, I want to thank our president, Crystal Watts, for the Blaile Education Association. Tonight's format is set up where we'll give each candidate a couple of minutes to introduce themselves. Uh, we will also have a question and answer period. If you have a question, please fill out a three by five card. Um, Jenny, if you can wave your hand, she can actually get one to you. So if you have a question, by all means, ask her. We'll do, each candidate will get a two minute time to respond to the question and follow up with a 90 second rebuttal. At the end of the format tonight, we will also have two minutes closing statements. Now we did invite uh, the two incumbents that are running unimposed, uh, Raymond Victor Momsen, as well as Ward Stewart. Uh, Ward Stewart has said that he will try to get here later on this evening, and we received word that Raymond Momsen is unfortunately ill for the night. But he will answer questions if we email him. So if you do want questions of our current school board, please let me know and we will get those answers to you as well. That being said, determined by a random coin flip, we will have Tony come on up first. And do you guys hear me okay? Because this sounds kind of weird for me. Sounds okay? All right. Thank you, David, and thank you for the VEA for allowing us to have the opportunity to speak to the citizens of, of Vallejo. It's not very often that we get invited to, to a forum, but uh, I'm thrilled that we finally will have the opportunity to, to discuss the concerns and issues that are very important to the citizens of Vallejo, and spe specifically the, the Unified School District. I'm uh, Tony Ubaldi, I'm, I'm, I'm a retired pastor and professor. I have a doctorate degree in religion and social ethics from Claremont School of Theology, Bachelor's of Arts in Public Administration, San Francisco State University, and an A degree from uh, Merritt College. I have been passionate about public education since my, my two children attended public schools in San Francisco and Sacramento. My diverse experience in public education spans for four decades. In the 1970s, I co-chaired and developed a bilingual education, and the very first, by the way, in the United States, and advocated for integration of San Francisco schools because that needed to be done because of federal mandated requirements. In Sacramento and El Grove School District, I was a member of the Finance Citizens Advisory Committee, helped pass two school bond campaigns, volunteered as a football coach for five years, in Vallejo, I served on a major aid committee that successfully passed a $133 million school bond and had been serving as the Citizens Oversight Bond Commissioners since 1998. I also served on a Solano Community College for four years. I currently serve on several nonprofit organizations here in Vallejo. And as a member of Vallejo City Unified School District Board of Education, I pledge to provide an effective leadership to mitigate the high dropout rate, ensure that every student has equal opportunity and access to the highest edu quality education, and support collaboration and open communication between students, parents, staff, and community. 
I respectfully ask for your support and your vote. Thank you. And thank you. And if I can get Robert to come on up. My name is Robert DePrado. I'm a psychology professor at Solano Community College, and I thank you for coming out here on this evening. I uh, jumped into this job or candidacy um, because I feel it is necessary to make some changes in the educational system. I have worked at Solano Community College for over 40 years, and as an educator teaching freshmen, English, sociology, and other classes, I realized that over the years their skills have not kept up with the quality of students that we've had. So in my experience, I feel that we need to improve the basic skills of students. We're doing one major job of revamping our educational system to try and uh, help students become more proficient in the school system. But we're finding that there are a lot of students who are from the high schools and not just the Vallejo system, but also uh, Fairfield and Vacaville who are significantly uh, deficient. And a lot of it is due to the fact that they are ESL students and as a second language they need a lot of tutoring and lower level English uh, skills. In my background, I have uh, graduated from San Francisco State University. I have a bachelor's degree in psychology, a bachelor's degree in sociology. I have a master's degree in psychology and specifically in the teaching of psychology. So I have also a minor in higher education uh, ed credentials and uh, the process of educating students. Since this time, though, I started at Solano in 1971. I also taught at a previous time with uh, the College of San Mateo. But while teaching at Solano, I did teach at other colleges and universities, including um, some of the local ones here. In my experiences with Solano, I've had many roles. Um, I developed a lot of new programs. I developed a human services program, which is an AA degree program for students to uh, fast track into the workforce. So instead of getting a master's in social welfare for six years or seven years, in two years they can go out and get a job and find out if they like it and move on from there. I've been a grant writer for the college. I've written over $250,000 in successful grants for, among other things, something called a smart classroom, which is now standard operating equipment for the college. I've served on many faculty senates. I've been chairman of the Retirement and Recognition Committee. And I've provided financial advisory support for diverse student groups. Last but not least, I speak fluent Italian, Spanish, and at one time was an ESL student myself. So I understand where students are coming from. And I think my two minutes is getting close. Yes, yeah. Tried to keep it as a guideline, but obviously we also want to make sure that we're fair. Uh, so, obviously, when you guys see me stand up over here, that's basically two minutes at that point. All right? Our first question is, how have you demonstrated leadership in the Vallejo community? I have developed leadership in Vallejo in many areas. I have been a volunteer for the police and fire department for since 95. I have been a board member of the Area Agency on Aging for several years. 
I have been a board member of the Boys and Girls Club, Continental Mega Boys Club in particular. I have also been in the Ethics Committee for Kaiser for several years. I have also been uh, a trustee of Solano Community College. And I have been a pastor. And I have taught uh, at Turo University. And these has enabled me to, to express leadership and show the style of leadership, uh, enabling and empowering people. I have worked with all ethnic, diverse community. I have called uh, the very first uh, a National Day of Prayer where I brought a lot of people together, all faiths, and, uh, and was perhaps one of the most successful ones that uh, the city has experienced. I was able to, able to, to bring a lot of people, all diverse groups. And um, I think I have also have held, held positions in various uh, uh, capacity in the uh, uh, enabling the unity events in Vallejo. Uh, the Pista Sanayo that attracts over 40,000 people annually and have also been participate, participating in various organizations, the Ministerial Association. And uh, so I have shown that my passion is not, it is broad. My passion is to enable and bring people together and, and articulate the particular <coughs> goals that needs to be done and accomplish them well. Thank you. And we will have around the 90 second rebuttal. How have I dedicated leadership to the Vallejo community? Um, primarily, I'm going to look at this from my work as an advisor, as a teacher, as an educator at Solano College, where I primarily began working with student organizations who were doing work out in the community. I established the Psychology Club, which is still in existence today, that does work out in the community. I have been a member of the Democratic Society. I'm also a member of the Western Psychological Association, which does a lot of research and work out in the community. On a personal level, for the Vallejo organizations, I also am involved in a uh, tennis program for developing the Glen Cove Center and uh, trying to get funds from the United States Tennis Association along with GRBD to fix the courts there so we can have uh, tennis for kids. And I'm a tennis under 10 coach for children. I've also taught in the Napa Youth Soccer League for several years with my daughter. Uh, currently, I am a member of the Vallejo Marina Advisory Committee. Um, I have a boat down there that people um, have asked me, since I'm the more articulate, outgoing activist, to speak for them on this committee. So we're trying to improve the marina. And I've been involved with um, the coastal cleanup that was just two weeks ago. And last but not least, I've been a firm member of Habitat for Humanity. Um, I oftentimes do things for neighbors to fix up houses and uh, am involved in uh, redevelopment areas for the city of Napa with the uh, redevelopment department. I got to thank the crowd for making my job a lot easier. I had a whole bunch of backup questions, and I'm really glad that you guys came up with some really good ones, so thank you. Again, if you want to, go ahead and talk to Jenny. She'll have a 3 by 5 card for you if you wish to make any questions or have a comment. The next question, what would you say is the greatest challenge to the Vallejo School District? And this time he's going to go up first. We will alternate of who speaks first. Oh, okay. Where do we begin? <laughs> we could do it from the top down. I made some notes about challenges. Um, I'm looking at the fact that there are a lot of challenges, not just to Vallejo, but um, 
also to other districts because of state budgets and state uh, issues. When we look at the fact that um, the state of California's budget is going uh, down and our, every year it seems like in education we never know how much money we're going to get. We can't plan for the full year and so that is a big one. I mean, even in a small business you need to know how much money you have for the next year so you can buy books and get uh, teachers and have uh, interpreters. So when I look at the situation that's going on here, let me just flip over to this page here that I had. Um, it says very simply that there are primarily um, issues with the lack of parenting in schools. There are issues with the relationship between the uh, teachers and the students and the respect that are, is there or not there between uh, teachers and students. I think sometimes the teachers should be given combat pay for some of the conditions they have to deal with, as I've seen. And I believe that um, when teachers have to uh, reach into their own pockets to fund some of the programs, then we find that to be a real issue. Um, safety at school is another one. I know that there have been a lot of uh, problems with uh, individual safety fights and uh, harassment and things like that. That's another issue that needs to be dealt with. But to summarize all of this in one simple way, it would be that all of the ills of our society are now coming onto the campus in droves. And we as educators, be we K through 12 or community colleges, are having to deal with all those issues. And students can't study if they don't have a good, safe, uh, healthy environment. Question is the greatest challenge in the school district. Correct? One of them. One. The biggest challenge, as I see, is developing leaders for the future, not only here for Vallejo, but also in the world. I think in order to graduate today, today in high school, we need to concentrate on making sure that they are sensitive to the needs of the world. But in order to do that, we need to deal with them to mitigate the high school dropout rate. We need to ensure that every student has equal access to the highest quality education. That we need to close the achievement gap that we're experiencing in our, in our schools. I'm deeply concerned about the campus safety, and, I'm, and, and we need to really express greater collaboration and cooperation among the community leaders, the stakeholders, such as business and labor, the school families, the parents, the students, the community, the classroom. We need to bring everyone together in, in order to make it possible for us to achieve the greatest challenge in our school district. We cannot do it alone. Okay. <clears throat> I'm also trying to pick the questions just randomly as well as trying to look for different handwriting. Uh, this next one, how many Vallejo schools have you visited? Which ones impressed you the most, and which schools didn't? And I will add to this question, the ones that you weren't impressed with, what can you see as room for improvement? How many schools have I visited? My goodness, I serve in the Oversight Committee of Major A. And, and part of my job as an oversight member commissioner is that I am to visit the schools. 
I was assigned in particular, which I chose, People's High School, uh, Patterson, Highland, and Loma Vista. Those were my assignment that I volunteered to oversee because of the concern for modernization and creating an atmosphere that would be viable for quality education. I've also spent a lot of time with, uh, as when I was a columnist, I visited, my goodness, every, practically every school in the district. I met with faculty, I met with students, I met with principals. So I am very familiar with the school districts and their needs. Which one, I cannot, to be honest with you, I cannot cite any of the schools that I felt were, what, what was the word you used, poor or, or, uh, yeah, uh, I, I felt. Which one impressed you and which one did? Yeah. Well, the one that impressed me the most was my wife's school, obviously, because I spent more time and, 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 and met many of the teachers and, and, and we spent a lot of time volunteering there. Uh, but the others, I don't know, I, I cannot uh, see any schools that I, I would be critical because everyone is doing the best they can. Thank you. To be honest with you, I haven't had all of the opportunities that uh, Tony has had to visit all the schools. Um, I have had several opportunities to visit the Glen Cove Elementary School since it is in my neighborhood. I've met with the principal there and I've met with a couple of the teachers there and I felt a real warmth. I felt that there was a real family um, of people that were working and dedicated. And it seemed like they were well organized. Um, I see both morning, noon, and night that uh, there's an orderly uh, activity schedule. Um, I see them playing and I hear them playing uh, at times uh, on breaks and things like that. So I did approach the principal about the an after-school program for the kids that would be a free program that they could go to the tennis courts and learn tennis and things like that. So I am working with him primarily uh, on that one. In regards to other schools, um, I have been to Mare Island. Uh, I have not gone into any of the schools, but I know a lot of the students that uh, graduated from Mare Island because a lot of them take advanced courses uh, from me at Solano Community College in Vacaville, excuse me, in Vallejo. Um, and I find that there's a, uh, a group of people there that use um, computers and a lot of electronics because that's one of the things they need to do and they need to take advanced courses in order to uh, go ahead and uh, take AP and graduate. Unfortunately, they don't always graduate from college classes because they're so dependent, I think, on their electronics and they need to think about using their natural skills. I know this next question is um, kind of a hot topic for the community of Vallejo. And I'm sure that both of you have heard of the incredibly high dropout rate we have with our high school students. The question that we have is how do you plan to fix that? And we're all chasing to go first. Whoever oh. speaks last gets to speak first. Oh, next okay. Time. Yeah, sure. I don't need to take notes. I'll add to um, It's a real problem. I think that um, safety on campus and um, concern for the safety of your child is everyone's responsibility, from the teacher, the janitor, the crossing guard, the neighbors, and, you know, to quote someone, uh, Clinton's wife, I guess, wrote the statement that it takes a community to raise a child, and so we have to be responsible to the children in the community. But I'm primarily concerned about the fact that the students themselves need to be 
taught more respect and that that respect, that discipline needs to be given to them. Uh, there needs to be detention, there needs to be punishments, um, and that's one way of at least getting them to stay in a course and to do well in a class. Now, in order to stimulate them educationally, I think we need to be more creative in some of the ways in which we offer courses. We also need to have counselors who are able to feel what the needs of the students are and find those students the right teachers in the right situation so they can prosper and learn. Because I think a lot of times when we teach for testing, that is a major problem. And the kids are just like, I already know this stuff, I don't want to do anything more, and I'm tired, and it's more fun being outside. Dropouts. I think we look at we need to look at models and currently look at the models that are working. If it is not working, let's adjust it and make sure that it's working toward keeping the kids in school. Secondly, we need collaboration. We need to touch the community and ask them their participation. We need students from from Cal Maritime Community College, Turo, and other educational institutions that would bring them to the community and start developing or peer teaching counseling. Um, one of the things that I've mentioned before is I think we need to take ownership. One of the things I mentioned earlier to my community is that we should adopt a school and make it possible for those kids to succeed. And I'm not saying adopting a school that states that we will do what we can, but rather in cooperation with the school and help them determine what their needs are. And then the community will respond to their particular needs. If it, they need tutorial, then we will respond to that. If they, we need cash or monetary support, we will do that. If we need role modeling, then we can do the same. I think it's, we cannot do it alone. We need collaboration, we need young people working with each other. One of the things that I proposed one, one evening, one morning at 2.30 in the morning was to create a school within the school. I woke up my wife at 2.30 in the morning and said, honey, what do you think about creating a school within the school? And I don't obviously have time to elaborate that, but I discussed it with the president of VEA and she was very receptive. I discussed it with the superintendent, and she was very receptive. So if I have time, I'll be more than happy to elaborate on that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Obviously, we got all kinds of questions from parents to just community members. Um, this is actually one from a teacher. It's often stated that in order to attract great management, you have to offer a great compensation package. Given the fact that Vallejo's teachers are the lowest paid in Solano County, how would you attempt to attract and retain great teachers? Teachers that people seem to like. Maybe. <laughs> or teachers that are able to help the students out in all kinds of different I fully believe that teaching is a call. That it is something that comes from within the educators. And we need to work in that direction and affirm the fact that they are called to the classroom. Many teachers I know are not, you know, that, that's not the first, first, first uh, requirements. First requirements is enabling them and empowering them to do the best they can in the classroom. That's, that means support in all bases. When kids have problems, when parents are not participating, and, and, uh, and have, have them, have them uh, address their particular needs, especially the health care. That's a great issue. 
not only to the teachers, but everyone. If we can say to them that we need to help you so you will have peace of mind at home, I think that's the other, other response. But uh, let me tell you that, that, that um, in order to support the teachers, we really have to recognize that they're not there to make money, but they're there to respond to their call, to serve and be the best educators that they can be. Thank you. This is one of my favorite issues because as a great teacher at Solano College, although I was never nominated for Teacher of the Year, uh, that award gets us a parking space and $200. But it's an award that you get from your faculty, uh, and they're the ones that do it. Attracting great teachers. We know right now that the future of education demands a need for more teachers. There's too many of us teachers that are old that are going to retire, and we need to bring in more teachers. So yes, we have teacher programs right now, such as my university, San Francisco State, which is a teacher's college traditionally. My father went there, he graduated from there, he was a teacher, he became a principal, and here I am following in his footsteps. We get students have to do student teaching, and they can do student teaching in your school, your school, and everybody's school for free as part of their educational program and get some units of credit. So that's one thing I would say. I also think that faculty should get a reasonable pay and that collective bargaining is something that needs to be done. I believe that uh, even though we are in a shortfall with the budget, um, you know, when people go after your retirement benefits and things like this, such as they're trying to do at the community colleges, I think that's very unfair. But one way to do it is to get good teachers by providing them with a variety of opportunities allowing them to be able to teach the way they want to teach, if they want to teach within a school, within a school like I did when I was at the College of San Mateo, that's a possibility. Give them stipends to go on to uh, sabbaticals and things like this, which would help keep them young and in the picture. Okay, next question. How do you plan to work with the Solano County Board of Education with the district? Oh, I can answer yeah. that one right away. <laughs> Good. I just happen to know a few people on the Board of Education who came from Solano Community College. I believe we have uh, Ray Silva. I believe we also have, oh, what's the other guy's name? Ford. Uh, who's on there, and a couple of other people, Mayreen Bates. And I have a good relationship with those people because I worked for Solano College in their educational foundation to raise money for the college and put on three major events along with uh, the help of the Solano County Board of Education. And I think that we do work together. I mean, this is a symbiotic relationship. And so what the city does, what the county does, should be in concert. We should never be able to, but we shouldn't be at odds. And therefore, they should be very supportive, and I have a good personal relationship with those people. I see no problem in working with them. Thank you. When I, when I ran for a community college, I think basically all of the trustees of the Solano County Board of Education endorsed me. So I have worked with them for many years. Even the former superintendent endorsed me. And currently, my co-chairperson of my campaign committee, our president and vice president of Solano County Board of Education. So you can tell that there is a lot of support going on currently. And I know that I can count on them because I can work with them and uh, learn from them. 
So thank you for that question. Over the last uh, decade or so, there's been an emphasis of academic education. This question simply say, states, how do you feel about vocational education? How do I feel about vocational education? I recall when I was a junior in high school, I couldn't do too well. I didn't do too well in academics because I was an immigrant and I grew up in this country. And the academics was not my first choice because I had a hard time. And I love football, athletic, I love music. And I know that in order to, to play football, you have to good, have good grades, at least see. And that's where the coaches suggest that I go take courses, industrial arts, dancing, PE, and all those good stuff. And let me tell you, I learned a lot. I learned a lot. I think the, there's a greater call to, to, for us today to, to establish workforce immediately because of the problems of the economy. We need to find people who can work immediately and create, and, and create a greater and viable economy for us. Not all students are capable of preparing themselves for higher education. We need to be sensitive to those who need special attention. And I strongly feel that vocational education should be one of our, our uh, highest, one of our high priority for our students today, to give them the great option to be a viable member of the community and especially to impact the workforce. Thank you. Uh, this is a very easy question for me because when I came out of the elementary school system in San Francisco, um, back in the 1950s and 60s, we had something called a tracking system. The tracking system was that you would get a series of tests and even uh, an IQ test that would say, I think you're better skilled at something in the vocational technical area as opposed to the academic area. And so I feel that when we take the time to measure what people's skills are and give them tests or classes like career guidance classes, they can say, you know what, I really enjoy working with my hands and I want to be an artist or I want to be a sculptor or I want to be a mechanic. That is very helpful because these kids will then stay in classes and can go on and make a healthy, viable living. I'm looking at the fact that if we find the right jobs or the right person, they will be part of the solution in this country and not part of the problem. By that I mean they could be working and making $85,000 as a starting welder, as a starting mechanic in an auto shop. And $85,000 a year is what our students are getting when they come out of a two-year program at Salon. That's the salary that I get after 40 years. Okay, next question. If you are asked to cut, would you cut staff or teachers' pay? And why would you make that choice? Now I have to play administrator. <laughs> um, first of all, I think you need to look at each individual district. 
And I see within the Vallejo Unified District that there are a lot of staff people and administrative people that are uh, taking up a lot of time, space, and income. And when you have, for instance, a budget, uh, let's see, a CEO, a chief executive officer, a chief financial officer, and a chief financial officer has an accountant, and that person has another person working for him, and they're making totals of, let's say, $300,000. How many teachers can you then hire who are then going to go out and make money for the district when they're the ones that make the money? So if a teacher has 30 students in class, you do the FTES, is what we call it, or ADA, and you figure out that that teacher's bringing in more money than someone who is up there making 150, 200,000 and balancing the books. Why can't we outsource some of these things? Now then again, we could also think about the fact that this is a messy room right here. Uh, why can't some of the kids who made the mess clean up this mess, save time for the janitors so that they don't have to work so hard, and we may not have to cut janitors or maybe ask people to voluntarily cut back some of their uh, duties and responsibilities. Uh, take floating times and things like this. So teachers are the last to get cut. I don't have to play administrator to make this decision because I'm running for school board. And my responsibility is one of governance. I have been asked by many people in the forum that I have attended this past few weeks, if I were to cut someplace, where would it be? The last place I would cut would be the classroom. Because that's where education takes place. And that's the business of the school district, to educate children. So therefore, that would be the last place I would, I would cut. I also feel that because of my close relationship to the community, I'm very active in a community, and you can find me all over the place, that I have entree to the community to seek their help, their support, the faith community, the diverse community of Valencia, both business and labor, that we again cannot do it alone. We need to have the full community support. Thank you. Okay, we uh, just got a few more questions, and funny enough, just a few more minutes. How do you see Vallejo Unified School District as different than our neighboring school districts? Currently, I see Vallejo School District as someone is, that is the most diverse in, a, in our community, in Solano County. We have many gifts, we have many talents, we have many good people who are willing to give the best that they have. And I'd like to capture that, I'd like to, to really access that and bring it to the successes of our kids. One of the things that I'm discovering also in that my campaign and visiting with people, the stakeholders in particular, is that our schools are succeeding. We have many schools that are succeeding today. I attended the last board meeting, and we have hundreds of kids who are honored because of the grades went up, the points of tests went up. We have at least eight schools that were honored because of the high achievements. Teachers were getting recognized for the first time. I talked with the middle school, with the uh, chapter school parents not too long ago, three weeks ago, and they're excited about the middle school of Davidson, the charter school of Davidson. They're participating, they're excited, they're succeeding, they're excellent taking place. So I think we that our strength of the people once their energy are focused and ready to go and given the support, 
We have something special going on in Vallejo. Thank you. Vallejo versus neighboring districts. There are a lot of neighboring districts. Um, I think one of the things we can start with is things that have been said about the Vallejo Unified School District and the city of Vallejo and all the meetings like at the Tarot University meetings, the sister city programs and things like this. We seem to have more issues, uh, more social issues, more economic issues, more uh, family issues, more crime issues, and bottom line is people, even if they have not been directly affected by it, have a perception that Vallejo is not a nice place. So what is happening? What is happening is that there are a lot of people that are in this, I don't want to call it a white flight because they're not always white, but a lot of people who are educated are saying, I'm not going to let my kid go to a junior high or high school here. I'm going to send them to a charter school, a Catholic school, or even a private school. One of the neighbors where I live said that when her daughter graduates from uh, Stemple School over here, that she is then going to take her to Sacramento, to a school up there that she only has to go to school two days a week and still continue in her high school. And I'm going, why? She said, well, because I don't want to go to Hogan or I don't want to go to Vallejo. And, and it's like, she's got this image that it's best for her child and so they're doing it. We have friends also who are teachers and I hear that there are administrators who don't have children in these schools. So why don't the administrators and the teachers who are working in the school systems allow their children to be in these schools? That's the question we need to ask. Well, speaking of charter and private schools, that leads us to our next question. How do you plan on using charter and private schools within our public school system? You know, it's, it's a little kind of a weird one. I think what the, the main idea is, obviously there's a big controversy over charter schools and some private schools. How do you plan on using charters and private schools within Vallejo and within our public school system? Who had the question? Hmm? Who had the question? This was, how do you something incomprehensible, charter and private schools within our public school system? That's the actual question right there. How do you rule? How do you rule, maybe? Or you? Use view. It could be view. could be view. Okay. Okay. Um, I believe that in any educational school system, there's a place for many different types of schools. I think that um, when we look at charter schools, what are they chartered about? What is their main purpose? If we look at Mare Island, it's MIT. And when I first heard about that, I said, you know, what is this? You know, and these kids are all thinking that their future MITs, the real uh, school in technology. Um, but I see that they're not, and that's the negative side. The positive side is that they see sometimes they're a little more disciplined, a little more organized. Um, you give them an assignment and they can get the job done. Um, I think that if with private schools, a lot of times people go there because they want their kids to get a sense of either religion or philosophy or something that ties them together. And that's very important for kids to have something to hold on to. Uh, when they say, my parents went to this school and I'm going to join the Italian-American club because my parents were there and so on and so forth and they stick with it. Um, I also think maybe open schools and we can, Tony mentioned earlier, a, a school within the school. And I think that's a great idea. Um, when I was at the College of San Mateo, we had a school within a school. And we had um, a class of, uh, I want to say 25, 30 students who met four days a week, uh, five hours a day, and in four weeks completed one whole semester. Because 
They were dedicated, they were motivated, they weren't bored, they couldn't fool around, and they were very successful. And I think maybe if we alternate some of these schedules, uh, that students would stay in school if you gave them some options. hard to, to understand the question. But let me say this, that when the charter school movement first came around, I was truly opposed to it. Because it's basically a way of getting away from public education. And public education is one of my highest priorities in life. And support, I've been supporting it most of my professional career. But when I see a public, a charter school within a school, such as Davidson, that convinces me that it is possible that excellence can take place when there are complete participation from all the stakeholders, starting with the kids who are highly motivated, who are doing an excellent job. When you have parents who talk about it and brag about it, that tells me something is going on that is exciting. And having the sense that the faculty, the teachers, are, are fully supported by not only the, the administrators, but the community as a whole. And my understanding is that the, the, the board of trustees are also supportive of charter within, within the school district. So I'm, I'm saying to you is that we need to create options, we need to create opportunities. Not everybody learn one way. There are many ways of learning, there are many ways of educating kids, and we need to find the very best ways of doing that. Creating option, I believe, is one of the things that the school district must consider. Thank you. I think we got time for two more, two more questions. Okay. At least you didn't answer it, thank you. <laughs> it's okay. This is actually one that I've heard of in, as a teacher myself. The current, <coughs> excuse me, that actually gives me a chance to cough anyway. The current superintendent publicly, publicly states that she wants people to contact her. But when teachers have emailed or talked to her, she refuses to answer. The question is, if elected, will you work to change this or would you allow her to continue to ignore teachers? <laughs> Tough one, but it is easy. A Yesterday, I called the superintendent's office because I met a f father who wants his son to be accepted in the district. And it has taken two weeks, and they have not gotten a response. So I called her. And within, I would say, five minutes, I got a call from her and got the specific information and asked me how to get a hold of that person. And I gave the information. Oh, my goodness. And, and so, when we're talking about a major portion of the community, the classroom teachers, not getting acknowledgement from the superintendent, as a member of this, the governance, I will take that very seriously and correct that. Because that is something that should not take place anywhere. Now, there may be protocols that one would say that the teacher has to go through this process. It depends on the particulars. But I need to follow up and know the specifics. One cannot just make assumptions. There are protocols that we need to respect and honor. But if I know that the superintendent denied the opportunity for a classroom teacher, then I, I have deep, deep concern about that. Thank you.
Yeah. Um, in the 40 years that I worked at Solano Community College, I never had an, I was never turned away from meeting with a superintendent president, ever. I would always ask, can I have five, 10 minutes of your time? And I'd talk to every seven of them, sometimes walking in with a list with 30 issues on it that were complaints. They took the time, they listened, they took my paper, and that was it. And I think that that is a responsibility of the superintendent president. I don't think it's the responsibility of the superintendent president only to listen to the committee chairs that's in that huge table of organization that you have in this city. I don't think it's a requirement that she talk to a trustee or a trustee candidate. Um, in fact, in the school district system, we oftentimes as faculty don't like it when somebody says, oh, I know Marie, and I'm going to go talk to Marie, who's a trustee, and she can talk to the president, and then things get done because we just circumvent the normal channels. And I think that that kind of micromanaging is not something that we appreciate at Solano College that has been done in the past by former trustees. So, open door policies are good. And I think if you want to ever bring about change, you need suggestion boxes, you need open doors. Closed doors don't work. That closes minds. Final question, and we will have closing statements. I'm going to change this just a little bit. What basic skills do you feel are lacking to make students successful at college? And Robert, you're up. I was just going to write something down, but I don't need to Oh, basic skills for college. Where do you begin? Can you read a book? Okay, it doesn't have to be a college level book, but it would be nice if it would be a college level book. Can you read a newspaper and can you understand the newspaper article? Can you interpret what is fact, what is fiction, what is bias? Number one, gotta have that, okay? Number two, can you do mathematical equations? Can you do math problems so that you can have a checking account and balance it and conduct your own budget? Because regardless of what you do or work or whatever, you're going to have to run a cash register if you're working at Mickey D's or whatever the heck it is. But if, and I even do this to my students. I said, what happens when the calculator breaks? And you have to do it by hand. Do you have to go through the rote times tables and figure it out? No, you have to be a creative thinker. I also think that students who are coming into college need interpersonal skills. They need to know how to get along with others. Others of different races, different religions, different color, I don't care what. You need to get along because we are one world, one people, and you may have your biases, but you know what? Get over it because it's a very short world here. Um, I also think that students need persistence, determination, motivation. And if you nip them in the bud when they're in uh, high school and are burnt out because they don't like high school by the time they come to college and they all say they have to go to college because that's you know, what you need these days, and then they don't have the skills, we do the same thing and cut them out of the system. Um, so they're losing once in high school, they come here, and if they're not successful in the first semester, they lose again. So, Teach them motivation, teach them persistence, teach them how to ask for help. Okay, thank you. When I started serving as a trustee of the Solano Community College, I was overwhelmed when I got reports from the administration and a student statistician, statistician that over 50% of our students need remedial. 
That means writing and math. Those are the two weakest problems that many of our students were experiencing then. I think in order to also succeed in college, beside the remedial, if that's <coughs> necessary, is understand what the future needs are in the world. And I'm not talking again about the Bay Area. I'm talking about creating and educating students for a global workforce. That means understanding the diversity and contributions of the people that they work with. Begin in the classroom, begin in the community, start, start attending events, cultural events, participating in creating, uh, may they be community organization, volunteer with Boys and Girls Club or Kids Group or Adults Group, Era Agency on Aging, for instance. It's important that they recognize that this is not just a one-dimensional education. It has to be multi-dimensional. It's very important that they are exposed to liberal education. That it is one should not simply graduate because one is excellent and academic, but one should excel in relationship, cultural understanding, and respect of people, especially in the area of citizenship, which is lacking in our society. Thank you. Before we get to closing statements, I do want to thank both of our candidates, and if I can get a round of applause for both of them, please. Thank you. I do appreciate your time. I know how limited your time will be over the next month, and personally, I do wish you both the best of luck on your campaign and on your election. For closing statements, again, determined by a coin flip, 25 minutes. As I stated earlier in my, my introduction, that I have been involved in public education for almost four decades. This is not something that I just decided to, to do because, because the opening took place. I helped integrate San Francisco, which is federally mandated, it took us three years to actually put everything together to bring people together. That includes busing, that includes you name it. It took us three years to do that. And I sat in that com committee for those years. I chaired the very first bilingual education in this country. And was sensitive to the needs of those who are not, not proficient in English. How do we respond and how do we educate those kids so that they can acculturate themselves in society? I've been involved in raising money for the school districts, both in Sacramento, San Francisco. I've been in the finance committee. I even volunteered as a football coach because there were particular needs, the attention that some of the kids needed. I have served, I probably call Vision 20, Vision 2000 in particular. <clears throat> I served in a committee to determine the, the future of this district. And one of the most important things that came out of that is uh, getting uh, a, a, to pass a measure, measure A bond that was $133 million. I was part of that committee. And I have been an oversight committee for all these years since 1998 to make sure that the money was being used properly. I represent, I went to schools to make sure that, that the money was be, being spent accordingly. But what's important is that I know what our immigrant students are going through. I know what people who are going through ESL because I went through the same thing. I was challenged as a high school. I couldn't, I couldn't graduate in high school. 
I couldn't graduate in college because I could not write, I could not speak well. And these are the kids that I can, that I can really relate to. It took me till graduate school to, to, write, to, to learn how to write. So I can really, I have the empathy and, 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 and really uh, uh, the strength, to un uh, the understanding of what our children are going through. So I feel that I am prepared, I am ready. This is only a two-year term. And I have been there. I, this is not a Johnny completely situation. This is, I have been doing it. And I am ready to go and prepared to go and start. Thank you. Some closing thoughts. Um, I decided to go into education because my father was an educator. He was a music instructor. He taught everything musical in South San Francisco Unified School District. I know what it's all about from a music point of view. I even took music lessons, but not from him. Um, Later, I had friends who I grew up with that were a little ahead of me who said that they were going to college and to become a teacher, and one of them actually was a teacher at Balboa High School. And I really looked up to him, and he was sort of like my big brother because I was an only child. So I had two role models, my father and my friend Dean. I had dedicated parents who taught me I had older friends who mentored me in school. I was primarily influenced to go into education as a freshman at San Francisco State University when my instructor in psychology um, showed me the sensitivity, the empathy, the care that can happen and make people believe in themselves. Since 1971, I have been in the trenches. And I mean trenches because I teach 250 students every semester. Now, some of you math teachers out there, do the math, okay? That's 40 years, two semesters each. That's 80 times two, whatever, you figure it out. Anyway, I don't have my calculator. Besides the regular teaching obligations, I've always volunteered in organizations on campus, with students, I have been an advisor for various clubs, including the Psychology Club, the uh, Gay Students Union Club. I've been involved with sports in the Sports Boosters Club. Um, so my experiences at Solano College haven't been just teaching obligation. I've always volunteered beyond what is normal. Um, I've written grants. I've written over three grants which have been very successful for something called the Smart Classroom that now is standard procedure throughout all of our campus classrooms and people love having those technologies so they can use it with their students. I've been active in community work. I've been active with the California Teachers Association, with the NEA, with the PAC groups, with the Faculty Senate over several years. And I've even been on negotiations teams so that I can understand college budgets or community college budgets and K through 12 budgets. I can read through the lines and I know when the numbers don't coincide. Finally, I would like to say that I am a creative individual. I can think outside the box. I think I'm a very objective person. Um, I believe also that I'm a critical analyst, so I don't always believe what's been told to me. Um, lastly, I just want to read one little short motto that I have that has been my mantra for the last 40 years. It's entitled, Press On. Nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful men with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. 
Education alone will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. And I believe that I don't need this job as much as you need me in this job. Thank you. Okay, again, thank you for coming out tonight. Special thank you to both our candidates. I do appreciate your time.